Mr. McFarland, thank you. How would you describe the threat from religious extremists when you were National Security Advisor to President Reagan? In the early 80s, we experienced uh, state-sponsored terrorism, but we also began to see the first evidence of uh, subgroups that were not accountable to any nation state, groups that had no territorial foundation of their own or apparent ambitions for territorial gain for themselves, but were driven by their own interpretation of scriptures and an interpretation that justified violence against all who didn't disagree or didn't agree with their own way of interpreting the Quran. How has a security threat evolved from then till today? Well, the threat has evolved in becoming far better financed and from getting more adherence through sensational events such as 9-11, the bombing of the USS Cole, American embassies in uh, Africa, but in short, uh, presenting to Muslims from Morocco to Indonesia that they are in a conflict, that America is against them, and yet that they are winning in the sense that with these actions that by their interpretation expose the weakness of the United States, that their movement can ultimately prevail and uh, even against other Muslims, this extremist doctrine will be proven and vindicated as uh, worthy of dominating the world. Recently, you have worked extensively on Sunni-Shia re reconciliation in Iraq. Can you talk a little about that? It's been very fulfilling to bring together the leaders of the Shia and Sunni community because two things have happened. First, they've been able to get beyond the grievances that each may have over how they've been treated by Saddam Hussein or other leaders, and to acknowledge the common ground, the common interest that all of us have in raising families, in peace, in education, health care, housing, the things that make life tolerable and worthwhile. But the second thing has been that they've been able to forgive and engage to use their authority in law to provide guidance more broadly throughout the Muslim community, throughout Islam, really, again, from Morocco to Indonesia, that suicide bombing, for example, is not a way to get to heaven, but a crime that killing anybody is a crime, not a virtue, that no one has the authority to make judgments about the lives of others, that God will do that someday, but it's not for men to make those choices. So this bridging, this improved understanding, forgiveness, honoring, and then working together in concrete projects to make the lives of Sunni and Shia better is what's coming from it, and it's been a very fulfilling uh, undertaking. Jesus is considered a great prophet in the Quran, second only to Muhammad himself. Christianity, Judaism, Islam all have a common father in Abraham, yet it seems so much emphasis is on the differences. Do you know of any serious effort beyond the one you just described that emphasizes the common ground that Muslims, Jews, and Christians share? Well, I've been very impressed by your own bridging uh, program, which has been enormously helpful in its ability to fashion the fatwa issued last fall that is now available to Muslims throughout the world and to Christians and Jews that demonstrate that our own leaders underscoring this common origin in our faith really give us a, a basis for transcending these disagreements. 
and that uh, we really can live together. And this is with the authority of the leaders of our religious communities, Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, Muslim. Uh, it's a very powerful witness when the leaders of each of these faiths stand up and acknowledge the obligation to love one another. Do you believe that ignorance and fear power religious extremism, or is there something else, uh, any merit in the words that they are uh, taking from the Quran, or from the Bible for that matter? I believe we are seeing in Islam today uh, what I would call from my days in Texas growing up, a revival, that is a searching for truth about what our obligations to God are. Now bear in mind, this takes place in Islam after a Cold War. Muslims, like anyone, are looking for answers about how societies organize themselves to provide the best welfare for all of the people. And they've seen that communism failed, it lost the Cold War, and yet the images of democracy and freedom that they see, primarily on television, are not always very uplifting. Things like Madonna and rock music. And so, inside the Muslim community, there is an introspection underway. Some, however, emerge from that introspection, believing that they have a unique interpretation of what is right and that it justifies violence to kill anybody that doesn't agree with them. Well, that is profoundly wrong. And it is, however, for Muslims to join with Christians and Jews to proclaim and tell all Muslims that this is not justified by the Quran, and indeed we can and must live together in brotherhood. It has a profound effect when words such as your fatwa are given to Muslims from Morocco to Indonesia because it dismisses and removes any legitimacy from the idea that killing somebody else is ever justified. Mr. McFarland, what role can a national security advisor play to help establish bridges with Muslims? You know, a national security advisor or a counterpart in the UK or France or Japan usually operates within the framework of a political system that may be based on balance of power or some construct that has historical effectiveness. However, we almost never bring into political life and governments the idea that there is a role for religion. And it's a curious uh, flaw, I think, because clearly every human being of faith relies upon their own relationship to God to govern their behavior day to day. So if you can fashion a way as National Security Advisor to encourage efforts to bring people to a table where they may disagree, however, they come there accountable to their God, not to a government. Their behavior, I think, is likely to be different. Now, this may not be through formal government officials, but if officials can encourage parallel efforts by men and women of faith to sit together in a context of Abrahamic worship, acknowledging their common principles that bind us together, and then tackle problems by starting with their own obligation to God to reach out, love one another, you're going to have a, a different behavior than you would when diplomats gather accountable to governments. Thank you, Mr. McFarland. Uh, we really appreciate your time.